Morning. Greetings all. Welcome this evening. Glad that you're here. My name is Price Harding. I have the, uh, just the great privilege of being chairman of the board of the Trinity Forum. And uh, I'd really like to welcome all of you here. Um, for some of you, I'm guessing it's your very first time. For others of you, you've come on previous occasions. And so, like me, you may be able to reflect upon the reason that you're here tonight. If it's your first time, I can share with you that by the end of the event, you'll know why you came. And uh, if you've come before, I'll just share with you why I'm here tonight. So most of you are likely from around the Washington, D.C. area. I'm not. I'm here quite a bit, but I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And when you get out of the, wor out of the world of D.C., you realize that you begin to believe that a lot of what feels really crazy about your world seems to, in many instances, emanate from here. <laughs> and so, on occasion, I like to come and just participate in, in kind of with wonderment about how it all occurs and what's happening. The thing I love most about the Trinity Forum, though, having now been involved with it for nearly a decade, is the fact that at these events, I get to hear thinking, I get to hear ideas, I get to hear really a conversation that is in some ways discordant with the rest of the culture where everything else can seem to be a little crazy and on occasion border on, I'd rather not be quoted, but insanity. Um, I find that when I come here, I find sanity and I find clarity and I find speakers who draw me closer to an understanding of what I believe I was created to be and how I believe I was created to think. And it's with that that I welcome you into a conversation this evening. And Cherie will tell you more about our two speakers, but I hope that you're able to kind of put bookends on your life and this parenthesis of time and uh, enjoy a, uh, just a sound that is different than what you hear everywhere else as we begin to engage in this conversation. Welcome this evening. Cherie. Well, thank you, Price, for that very thoughtful introduction. Welcome to each and all of you for to tonight's evening conversation on to love our neighbor, faith and flourishing in a world of need. Uh, we're delighted that so many of you came out on a very cold and chilly night. As you can tell, we have a very full house and actually had to shut down registration at one point. But if you had friends who wanted to be here tonight and could not make it, fear not. Uh, we are both recording and live streaming tonight's evening conversation. Uh, so feel free to tune in on our YouTube channel at the Trinity Forum. You can watch along. We'll also be posting pictures on Facebook and live tweeting as well, so you can follow along on Twitter. Uh, this event is actually the final evening conversation in a five-part series on faith and international development that we've been delighted to undertake through a generous grant through the New Venture Fund and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we had fairly ambitious hopes for this series. And I think we've been able to reach some of them. We wanted to take a broad sweeping look at some of the issues, the questions, the challenges and constraints of how faith and international development and aid all relate and build on each other. So we were delighted to kick off the series with Mike Gerson and World Relief President Stephen Bowman, who looked at thinking faithfully about international development and the unique contributions that faith-based efforts could bring to foreign aid and international development. We were then pleased to uh, welcome Ambassador Mark Lagon, who is also here tonight, and Professor Catherine Marshall to speak on faith, dignity, and empowerment, what a faith-based idea of dignity grounded in the Imago Dei had to say about how we understand those not like us and what our obligations to them are. We were thrilled to hear from World Bank President Jim Kim along with former member of Congress and UN ambassador uh, for hunger, uh, Tony Hall, to speak about mercy, justice, and holistic poverty alleviation. We heard from Hope from Healing Hands Executive Director, Jenny Dyer, about hope, healing, and peacemaking, and the role of faith in advancing global health. And tonight, this is the capstone to that series. So we are so delighted to welcome our speakers tonight. 
I also, in addition to wanting to just welcome each and every one of you, want to acknowledge just a few special guests. We're delighted to have our chairman of the board, Price Harding, in, from Atlanta, uh, as well as trustee Richard Miles, who's joined us tonight as well, and also delighted that our con lead convener of our Atlanta initiative, David Allman, has joined us for this evening, so thank you. If this is your first Trinity Forum event, a special thank you uh, for coming, and especially on such a cold night. For those of you who are new to Trinity Forum Evening Conversations, we work to provide a space and resources for leaders to engage life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And towards that end, we host programs such as the one tonight to connect leading thinkers with thinking leaders in wrestling with those big questions of life and ultimately coming to better know the author of the answers. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus synthesized and summed up the entirety of religious law as the, as the command to love God with all of what you are and to love your neighbor as yourself. And certainly, one of the great questions of life concerns what that means theologically and spiritually, as well as practically and even politically. Wrestling with the question, who is my neighbor, will have challenging implications, particularly at a time of rising tribalism and isolationism. So how do we understand the biblical injunction to love one's neighbor and care for the needy, even as resources seem limited and needs limitless? How do we weigh the urgent and pressing claims of emergency relief with a longer-term need for development and empowerment? What forms of care and aid are most conducive to flourishing? None of these are easy questions, nor are there easy answers, but we can promise that few have wrestled with these questions with the insight, the real world experience, the wisdom, or the vision of our speakers tonight, Rich Stearns and Peter Greer. Rich Stearns is the president of World Vision USA an extraordinary NGO which helps educate, shelter, vaccinate, care for, and uplift more than four million children in nearly 100 countries. Since their creation 65 years ago, World Vision has sought to help and enable people to escape poverty and injustice through their provision of emergency relief, the disbursement of microloans to catalyze neighborhood enterprises, the cultivation of clean water access, improved sanitation and basic health services, and other forms of aid. With a staff of over 44,000 around the world and annual aid disbursements of over a billion dollars, World Vision actually provides more foreign aid than many, if not most, European nations and serves as a vital international force for peace building and the conditions vital to flourishing. Before Rich became the president of World Vision, he had various roles with a number of Fortune 500 companies, including Parker Brothers Games, where he served as president, and Linux China, where he began as division president and ultimately went on to become named president and CEO. He's authored several books, including A Hole in the Gospel, which was named Christian Book of the Year in 2010, his work Unfinished, and he Walks Among Us, which he co-authored with his wife, Renee, who has also joined us this evening. He has his bachelor's degree in neurobiology from Cornell and his MBA from Wharton. After Rich gives brief keynote remarks, he'll be followed by his co-keynoter, keynoter, Peter Greer, who's the president and CEO of Hope International, another extraordinary NGO, 20 years old, which started by providing a dozen microloans in the Ukraine and has since wildly expanded its reach and serves more than a dozen countries where it provides training, housing, and a small loans to equip and empower its nearly one million clients to rise out of poverty. Peter previously worked as a microfinance advisor in both Cambodia and Zimbabwe and served as the managing director of Urwego Bank in Rwanda. He has written or co-authored numerous books, including The Poor Will Be Glad, the Spiritual Danger of Doing Good, Mission Drift, which was selected as a 2015 Book Award winner from Christianity Today, Entrepreneurship for Human Flourishing, Watching Seeds Grow, Created to Flourish, and The Board and the CEO. 
He is a graduate of Messiah College and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he serves as entrepreneur in residence at Messiah College, as well as a Praxis venture partner. After Pete and Rich's brief remarks, they will join me up here on stage. We will have a brief moderated discussion, and then we'll turn it over to you, the audience, for questions and answers. Rich, welcome. Well, thank you, Cherie, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I am just delighted to be with you this evening. And I already like this crowd, even though I haven't met most of you, because you wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't care about international development and helping the poorest of the poor around the world. So just the fact that you're here tonight uh, says that you care. And uh, so I like a crowd that cares about these things that are so important in our world today. Um, you know, I want to say a word, there's a lot of young people here tonight, and I mean by young, anybody under 60. Uh, but I want to, I want to encourage you if, you, if you followed my resume, uh, it looks like the resume, or it sounds like the resume of someone who has suffered from ADD all of his life. And if you are in your 20s and you're not sure where your career is headed, I want to comfort you. I sold shaving cream for Gillette. I have a degree in neurobiology. I, uh, I ran a toy company that sold Nerf balls and Monopoly games, and I, and I finally led a fine china company that sold luxury goods and very expensive luxury tableware to the wealthy. Uh, and only in the last 20 years have I come to World Vision. So if you're looking for a career in international development, you might have to be patient. But remember, Moses was 80 when he was called to lead uh, God's people out of Egypt uh, to the Promised Land. So, uh, hopefully you won't have to wait until you're 80 uh, for, to receive that calling on your life, but, uh, but be encouraged. I tell my own kids, and Renee and I have five kids, that uh, a career is a very long time, and there's an opportunity in a career to do a lot of different and really interesting things. So uh, if you're young and you're impatient, you know, relax. Uh, you've got a long time to, to figure this out. Well, I'm uh, really delighted to be able to speak tonight about a topic that I am just very passionate about, and it's the role of faith in development, the role of faith in our world, uh, and particularly the role of faith-based organizations uh, like Hope International and World Vision, who are just two of the many, many fine faith-based organizations uh, that are doing amazing things around the world. Uh, Cherie already gave you a little bit of World Vision 101, and let me just add a few things to that. Uh, I, I guess one important thing to know, and you've already shared this, is that World Vision has been privileged uh, to do this on a very large scale. I often uh, say to people, you know, poverty, global poverty, injustice, these are very big problems that often require very big solutions, and you have to have uh, some scale if you're going to really make a dent in what's happening in the world and if you're going to make a dent on, on helping the, the billion-plus people in the world that live in, in pretty extreme poverty. And so World Vision has been blessed to have the resources over the years to be able to address this on a fairly large scale. We estimate that we impact about 100 million people each year uh, through our work. But the other important thing to know about World Vision is that we work holistically across multiple domains or sectors. And those include food security and WASH. Uh, we're the largest provider of clean water in the world today. Uh, education, health, economic empowerment, gender issues, child protection, just to name a few of the various sectors in which we work. Now we do this, uh, we, we have become this jack of all trades because we've learned that there is never a single cause to poverty. Poverty has many causes. In fact, I often describe uh, poverty as an ecosystem. Uh, the poor live in an ecosystem that entraps them. And if you're going to alter that ecosystem, you have to work throughout the ecosystem, and you have to address many of the root causes, which are multiple, that uh, trap the poor in their, in their poverty. And if you do that effectively, and you work across these different domains and sectors, you can successfully help the poor to help themselves, to solve their own problems, to empower them, to lift them up uh, with human dignity so that they can have, uh, they can participate in a community that is thriving uh, and moving toward prosperity and out of poverty. 
You know, I wrote an article once for Christianity Today that said solving poverty is rocket science. And, uh, and I mean that because uh, so many of our churches often feel that poverty can be solved with a bunch of volunteers flying to Mexico for two weeks a year uh, to address uh, poverty in, in that area. And I think we all understand that poverty is much more complicated than that. Uh, the causes are much more systemic and deeply rooted than that. And, uh, and there is a place for amateurs, but there's also a real important place for experts in international development. Think about this, that tackling uh, poverty and marginalization, and, and uh, these are some of the oldest problems facing the human race. Um, pandemic diseases, uh, hunger, ethnic and religious tensions, uh, human rights violations, violence, the things that we see around our world today are the oldest problems facing the human race uh, ever since Cain killed Abel in the book of Genesis. And so in tackling these, these ancient problems, simplistic solutions don't work. Uh, and that's why we have to bring to bear the best thinking that we can all bring to the table from think tanks, from governments, from multilaterals, NGOs, academia, religious organizations, and also corporate actors. And I probably left out a few from that list. So let me just briefly try to set the stage for our discussion this evening, uh, particularly of the role of faith and the role faith can play in development. About 85% of the people on our planet have a deeply religious worldview, a deeply religious worldview. And the other 15% tend to live in the developed countries of the global north and are concentrated in our country uh, on the west coast and the east coast of our country. And everybody else in the world has a deeply, uh, profoundly deep uh, religious worldview. So here is the challenge that that poses. Um, but it's also an opportunity in international development. The challenge is that those who hold a profoundly secular worldview have a difficult time understanding and communicating with those who have a profoundly religious worldview. It's kind of a clash of cultures when you think about it. Poverty is not just a lack of material things. If it were, we could fix it pretty quickly. You see, drilling a well or vaccinating a child or building a school are useful interventions, uh, but they do little to change a community at the level of values and behavior. And you see, poverty is shaped and caused by cultural practices, belief systems, and community values. The hard work of lifting communities out of poverty and toward a future of prosperity always requires that communities change their behaviors, and behavior change is driven by community norms and values which are deeply rooted in worldview. Worldview, how communities think of themselves in the world, their agency before God, who are they before God. Now in most communities, it's often the religious leaders who define cultural norms and they perpetuate the value systems who hold, and, and they're the people that hold the moral authority in those communities and, and the people that community members look to for leadership and for uh, making the right decisions and, and governing behavior in the community. In other words, the religious leaders are often the gatekeepers of community values in our world. So that's why it's so vital in international development contexts to work with and through religious leaders and institutions. But you see, doing so requires the ability to speak from the framework of a religious worldview. People are often surprised that world vision can work effectively in Buddhist, Hindu, or Muslim context. But you see, that's because we understand the religious worldview. In other words, we get them and they get us as a people. One imam, one imam once said to one of our staff, we respect world vision because you are people of the book just as we are people of the book. He was saying that we understand your worldview because it's based on your relationship with God and what the Holy Scriptures say about the nature and character of God, which is also true of our religion. Now, there are cynics out there, maybe a few in this room, that would say many of the problems in our world are caused by religion or perhaps the abuse of religion, and there is some truth to that allegation. But I also believe that the answer to a religiously caused problem is often a religiously based solution. So if there's a problem being caused by religious leaders, it might have a religiously based solution as well. And I want to give you an example of this. 
In the early days of the AIDS pandemic in Africa, Christian pastors and priests were excommunicating people with AIDS. And even their widows and orphans were being excommunicated from churches because these pastors believed that it was God's judgment on their sinful behavior. So World Vision created a program back in 2001 called Channels of Hope. And we took church leaders through a three-day immersion course in the biblical response to HIV and AIDS. What does scripture say about how we as Christian people should respond uh, to the HIV AIDS pandemic, the people who are infected and the widows and orphans who are left behind? And we emphasized in that program that God calls his church to care for widows and orphans in their distress, a, a quote from the book of James. And that God calls us to be people of forgiveness and reconciliation and healing uh, and we're not to judge others, we're to help and welcome others, to love our neighbors as ourselves, especially when those people are in need and in desperate need of help. We then showed these pastors how they could preach about the importance of sexual fidelity and faithfulness in marriage, which would serve to reduce the spread of AIDS in their country and in their community. World Vision over the last several decades trained more than 400,000 church leaders, mostly in Africa, through this Channels of Hope program. The result was a massive movement of churches to speak out on the prevention of HIV and AIDS, but it also unleashed an army of church-based volunteers who cared for the sick and also the millions of widows and orphans that this disease left behind. You see, we were able to leverage the moral authority of pastors, and we were able to use them to help shape and change values and behavior in the community a far more effective strategy, I think, than just passing out millions of condoms to people who were engaged in sexual relations as a way of preventing AIDS. Well, let me shift gears and, and say, lastly, I want to say a few words about uh, foreign assistance programs and the importance of US foreign assistance, which is one of our topics this evening. I believe national governments have a unique role to play in our world, a role that only they can play. Yes, private organizations, churches, NGOs can also play critical roles, but they can't replace the unique role that governments play. You know, when I'm challenged with the question of why U.S. taxpayer dollars should be used to help people from other countries, I like to make my argument from our national values rather than the argument of self-interest. We should help because it's the right thing to do. You see, generosity and compassion uh, flow from our national values as Americans. Listen to these words from our own Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So this speaks to the role of government in protecting these human rights, but also says that these powers derive from our consent as voters. In other words, government policy was intended to be shaped by the values of the governed. So as a Christian, I know that the Bible speaks passionately about God's concern for the poor. The well-known passage from Matthew 25 is virtually a manifesto for the importance of caring about hurting people. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. You see, Jesus literally said uh, later on in that passage that when we do these things to those he called the least of these in our world, we actually do it to him. He is present with and among and in the poor and the suffering. So in a nation that is 75% America, 75% self-described as Christian, whose constitution calls for its government to derive its powers from the consent of the governed, it would seem that programs that assist the most vulnerable and protect human rights and dignity flow naturally from the core values of the Christian electorate in our country. And of course, I also support foreign assistance because it's good for the security and well-being of our nation. You know, I spoke at a conference in Seattle last month, and one of the speakers said something very simple and very compelling. It was this, 
We're all better off when we're all better off. Don't you like that? We're all better off when we're all better off. In other words, a better, safer world for Americans is only truly achievable when the world is better and safer for all of its peoples because we're all better off when we're all better off. You know, that verse should have been in the Bible. It's so good. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I better sit down now and turn it over to Peter because we'll never get to our discussion tonight. But uh, I do thank you for your presence here tonight, and I look forward to our conversation. Peter? When I arrived today, uh, Cherie asked me if I knew Rich from way back. And uh, my first thought was, absolutely. I have been in the way back of so many rooms. I have been in the way back of Urbana. And to share a stage with Rich Stearns is awesome. This is amazing. So thank you, Rich, for those remarks. And thank you for the Trinity Forum for organizing this. The Trinity Forum is, uh, I had my first experience with the Trinity Forum when I was uh, shortly after joining Hope. And I was excited to learn and to engage in the conversation. The thing that I have most benefited from, though, is not the content, but the friendships. The friendships that have started in this, part of a young leaders network that continue today and are some of my closest friends. And I believe life is just better when it's lived with friends. And I know many of you in this room would say something similar. This is not just a group of people that are coming together to engage in a discussion. This is a group of friends. And I love that, that we get to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you to all of you for being friends in this conversation. Now, when I originally uh, heard about international development, I was studying in Russia. And I was having lunch with an individual. And I was studying international business. I grew up as a pastor's kid. Faith was always very important to me. But I was really excited about international development, not necessarily because it was a way to help the poor, but it was a way to travel. And I thought that sounded really <laughs> exciting. And so I jumped in. And my faith was always, I would say, important to me. But as I heard about this tool of microenterprise development, there was something about the adventure. There was something about the excitement. There was something about the idea of traveling around the world and helping individuals to start small businesses that captivated my heart. So I started in, in Cambodia, I, I lived in Rwanda for three years, I served in Zimbabwe, and I would say faith was always a part of my motivation. I remember growing up and actually having the ability to, to have these eyes open to the fact that if you open your Bible, it is impossible to read it without seeing that we are to have a preferential treatment for those in need. It is impossible to miss. Over 400 times in scripture, it talks about these, uh, the quartet of the vulnerable, uh, those in poverty, the widows, the orphans, the strangers. Over 200 times in the New Testament, it talks about the idea of justice. So many times, so many ways that you all know about, it's impossible to read scripture and not come to the conclusion that there's some connection with whether or not we've even understood the message of grace by how we care for those in need. And so that was part of my story. It was part of, of my understanding. It also, I would say at that time, I believe that we were to call to serve with excellence. Matthew 25, this has already been referenced, this idea that as we are serving individuals in poverty, that it's possible we are serving Christ himself when I was hungry. And that means that we should do everything well. There should be no such thing as a poor performing Christian ministry because we believe that we are serving God and it's possible we are serving Christ himself in the work that we do. I also believed at that time that it was about love and devotion, not duty. I believe that we are people who have been deeply loved. We have been accepted by the almighty God. How can we not share with others? It's not about a duty. It's about this ability to respond to love. And I would say that I also believed at that time that we're to love all without any exceptions. Even the story that was referenced at the beginning, this idea about love your neighbor, the context is fascinating because an expert in the law is trying to understand who he doesn't have to love. When he says, who is my neighbor? He's asking a deceitful question and he's really asking, who's not my neighbor? Who are the people that are in the circle? Do I have to love the people that are close to me or do I have to love people far away? Do I have to love people that kind of dress the same or do I have to love people that are completely different? And the story 
about the person in need. The only thing we know, we, the person didn't even have clothes. There's no way to identify who the person is in need. And the message is anyone in need. That is our neighbor, and that is the invitation that we have to show up and serve. Now, all of those things, I would say I believed. All of those things, I still believe. I believe all of those are true. We're to love, not out of duty, but out of devotion. We're to serve all. We have an opportunity to serve with excellence. All of those things, because of our faith, they change the way that we respond. But over the last 20 years that I've been doing this international development, I've come to realize that it's not just the motivation, but it actually changes the way that we do this work. And I would say as a follower of Jesus, it was always my motivation, but today I say it's not just my motivation. It changes the way that I approach international development. And so I just want to share today three thoughts, three ways that my faith changes the work that I do. Not just is the motivation for the work that I do, but it fundamentally changes the way that I do my work. And it really started in 1999. Uh, I guess two years after you had begun at World Vision, I was moving to Rwanda with a whole lot of youthful idealism and optimism. And did I mention, I love to travel. And here I was living in Rwanda. And I'd heard about Muhammad Yunus. And I'd heard about this tool of microfinance. And I love the idea of it. I love the idea about preserving the dignity of those people that we serve. And I love the idea about having people have a job instead of just needing another handout. And so I started this this microfinance uh, work. It was only uh, four, five, four years after the gen five years after the genocide, and it was a time where a nation was was starting to recover. And one of the individuals that I ended up helping, his name was Florian, and he was one of the first people that I ended up helping in this tool of microenterprise development. We gave him a loan. There was training. And he started to have this business. And his was a gardening business. And I was one of his customers as well. And so he would come. And I would uh, receive the services. And, and he would come. And I got to know him and had this friendship. And on one occasion, I ended up driving him back to his home. And I was so excited to see his home because here's this business that's starting to grow. I was expecting to see this incredible change. And I saw where he lived. And it still was just as much a portrait of poverty. As, as it was, it, it couldn't have been any worse. His kids were still on bare feet. There was it, it was, it was a picture of poverty. And I remember feeling this incredible disconnect of saying, but I thought that if everyone had access to a microloan, that poverty was gonna be history, because that's what Muhammad Yunus told me. I thought that if everyone had access to this tool, that poverty was gonna be eliminated. And here it was, that someone is receiving the services, it seems to be a growing enterprise, and yet I look at the life, I look at the kids, and I have a really hard time seeing if anything has actually changed. And the reality is his business was growing. His business was flourishing. But a flourishing business does not mean a flourishing life. He ended up spending the increased profits on an alcohol addiction, on gambling, and on prostitution. And I vowed at that moment, that is not what I'm going to spend my life doing. <coughs> I believe that money simply enables what's in our hearts. And if there is no heart change, we are simply allowing today's oppressed to become tomorrow's oppressors. Money is, money is neutral at best. It enables what's in our hearts. And so without heart transformation, the question is, are we really making a significant impact? And this is where our faith makes all the difference because we believe we have more than microloans to offer. We believe we have more than the tools of development. We have the hope of Jesus Christ, which is, has been, always will be the most transformative message, the most incredible source of healing that this world has ever and will ever know until the time that Christ returns. We have more than just microloans to offer. At the same time, while I was living in Rwanda, I also got to know a staff member, and her name was Beata. And Beata was an individual that had lost almost everything in the Rwandan genocide. She was left with only two of her seven children. Her husband and her other five were killed. And I saw her as she was uh, leading uh, one of the branch offices, and, and the recovery in her life was, was remarkable. But uh, one day, she came to me and said, I am having uh, a challenge that I uh, have never thought I would deal with. And it turns out that there was the person, the wife of the person who had killed 
her children came to her and wanted help, wanted to receive these services, wanted to provide a business to provide for her family. And Be Beata said, how, how dare she come to me? How, how can I help her take care of her kids when her family has taken away everything to me? Over the period of time, I, 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 had, I had no words to say. But over the time, I saw the good news of Jesus permeate her heart. And she was able to not just serve this other woman. Over a period of time, they actually became friends. I think that is impossible. I think healing, I think reconciliation, I think that sort of miracle is absolutely impossible without someone actually receiving that type of love and forgiveness first. And it was beautiful. And so when I think about the challenges of the world, when I think about all that we have that is broken, I can't imagine leaving my faith behind. It is the source of healing. It is the source of strength. It is good news to those in need. And so what does that mean? If we believe that, if we actually believe that it's not just our good works, if it's not just our good deeds, but we have more to offer, then how does that translate into the programs, into the work that we do in international development? And, and again, three simple thoughts. The first is that we see whole people. We don't just do projects. We do it from a lens of seeing people as individuals created in the image of God. And as C.S. Lewis said, we've never met a mere mortal. We are looking at the divine, and that changes everything. This past week, it has changed the way that I respond to comments, talking about some of my friends in Haiti and Africa. It is not okay to look at a continent, to look at a nation, and write them off when there is beauty, there is strength. I don't look at those nations as something far away. I look at them as full of my friends and where the church is on the move. And when you discredit a nation, you discredit the God who made every single one of those people living in that nation. These are our friends, these are our colleagues, and you spend time with individuals, not doing projects, but getting to know them, and you will respect them. In Rwanda a couple months ago, I was with Severa, and Severa was an individual that started a business. She is a true entrepreneur. If she was born in the United States, she, you would know her name. She would have all kinds of industries. She employs 50 people in her community, and she has taken in eight orphans. And as my wife and I have thought about how do we open our home, Severa is not just a person in Rwanda. She is a mentor, she is a friend, and she is someone who embodies a bold and courageous faith that I want to have. I don't just look at individuals around the world and do projects. I see beautiful, powerful, competent, capable, dignified people created in the image of God. And that changes how we talk about them. It changes how we do the projects. Second, I believe that this idea of faith informing not just our motivation, but the very work that we do, it allows us to focus on the kingdom and not our little clan. When I joined Hope, if I am honest, and I would be at an event like this, and I would hear great words from, from other organizations, I would have something in me say, oh man, they just did such a good job and I'm going to sound like a juvenile little kid when I get up there. <laughs> and the reality is I would feel the sense of jealousy. I would feel a sense of envy when I would see some of my friends featured on all kinds of different things. I had a couple friends that were featured on Oprah. Oprah, like that is the best. They were on Oprah, and we were just together at a Trinity Forum event, and then they're on Oprah. It's incredible. And the reality, though, is I believe that when we focus on our faith, we realize that those of us in this room, we're not little warring clans. We're the same family. We're the same family. And if there is a foe, it's certainly not other organizations that are doing this good work. It is, it, it is, the, it is the, the spiritual realm that we are waging against. It is poverty. It is injustice. It is all of these problems. Can't we please find a level of unity because we're in the same family. We are on the same team. And that means when someone else is experiencing incredible growth, we should be the first ones to stand up and say, way to go. And Rich, as you have announced your retirement, way to go. It has been incredible to watch what God has done through 20 years 
of faithful service. And may we all live and serve as faithfully as you have set the example for us. We are part of the same family. And I believe that that means when we look at the world as the fact that we are part of family, it changes and it opens us up to collaboration. It opens us up to partnership. It opens us up to say, how can I bless you? When we have our friends at Five Talents, the initial approach is, what do we have? How can we serve together? What can we do to be a blessing to you, to build the kingdom together? Because together is a far better way to approach this incredibly difficult work than if we're all replicating our own little efforts. I believe our faith allows us to have a posture of unity in a world of division that this world desperately needs to see. And the last thought, our faith allows us, when we look at the church, to not see it as a fundraising tool, but as the bride of Christ. Originally, when I joined this, I thought I had to go and show up at a few churches to maybe get a few donations for the work of Hope International. Today, when I show up, I am looking at the bride of Christ that is going to exist far after Hope International is no longer in existence. This is what the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so when we show up, when we have church partnerships here and around the world, we don't just look at something that we can extract. We see it as the bride of Christ that we get to make even more beautiful waiting for the day of Christ. In the work that we've done, we've changed our approach because of this belief. And my hope is that around the world, no one knows the name Hope International when they see our savings group model. My hope is that they see the local church showing up in their community, loving and serving. And if any credit is given, <laughs> it's given to the one who said, this is my bride. And we want to simply equip that bride to shine brightly in this world of incredible needs. So it allows us to change from a posture of saying, how can the church be used to our ends? And it says, how can we partner with what God is doing through the church? Last thought for me. My belief is that our faith is not just an add-on, not just something bolted on, but it is at the core of who we are and what this world needs. The world doesn't just need bread. It needs the bread of life. It doesn't just need more water like I need water. <laughs> it needs the living water. And that allows us to change. But my belief is that in three generations, most of the faith-based organizations will have nothing to do with the faith that they were birthed in. Over the past couple of years, I've been studying what causes organizations to drift, what causes the passions of the first generation to become the preferences of the second generation and become irrelevant to the third generation. This is the historical precedent. There was a 1512, the Pope Julius made an edict of this something called Montes Pietatis. And it was this way that the church had to serve the poor. And it was this way of reaching out and serving people in need. And, and there's this edict, and it was started by the Franciscans, and it's this beautiful history, the way that the church helped people in poverty. And today, they are known as pawn shops. Pawn shops were started as a way for the church to help people in poverty. It is possible over time for us to forget the vibrancy the core of who we are. And so my hope is that in this work, in this conversation, we'd be people that spur one another on to love and good deeds and that we wouldn't forget that our faith matters in this work. It matters deeply. It is what the world needs. And because of that, my prayer is that we'll be people who reject any attempt to bifurcate our model, who refuse to say that our faith will only be confined to the halls of worship and not to the streets of practice, that we will be people who stay true to the mission that we've been given. And to do that, remember that there is one day where the ultimate development projects are completed, the day where Jesus himself will wipe every tear from their eyes, where there will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain, no more poverty, no more injustice, for the old order of things has passed away. And so until that day, may we learn to love and serve with all that we have, and may we never forget that our faith matters.
Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you, Peter. There is a lot there that we could discuss, and our time is already running out, so we will just get straight to it. And Rich, you touched on this briefly, but one thing I wanted to start off by asking you both is we're living at a time where there is, nationalism is on the rise in both the United States and in European countries. Uh, there's a growing sense, uh, whether it's America first, uh, that we should take care of the problems within our own country. Uh, and certainly there are a great deal of problems, whether it's the opioid crisis, rural poverty, growing inequality and equity and the like. Why should Americans prioritize the problems of developing countries over the ones in their own, in their own home? Well, I, let me just first say, Sheree, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm also very alarmed at the spirit of nativism and nationalism in the United States because John 3.16 doesn't say God so loved the United States of America that he gave his one and only son. It says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And so uh, as people of the Christian faith, um, the value of a life in Rwanda is equal in God's sight to the value of a life in New York or Washington or Chicago or, you know, pick your American city. Um, so I, I'm very concerned about this, and I'm, I'm especially concerned that many Christians are being swept along with that narrative, you know, that uh, immigration is bad and refugees need to be banned. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm giving a speech in two days to the Evangelicals for Life conference, and um, uh, I'm speaking uh, from the life of Christ and, and uh, the model of Christ and how he went in his public ministry, he touched and spoke to and healed and associated with the dregs of society. And, you know, his encounter with a leper uh, in Mark, uh, it's captured down, I think, a couple of the Gospels. But it says, a man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, you got to put this in perspective that no other religious leader of that day would have spoken to a leper. Uh, they were unclean, uh, they were banished, they were marginalized, they lived in leper colonies. No other religious leader would have even stopped to speak to a leper. But it says, uh, Jesus, filled with compassion, reached out and touched the man. And he said, I am willing, be clean. So not only did he speak to the leper and acknowledge his humanity. He touched him. He broke Jewish law. He touched this unclean man. And he said, I am willing, uh, be clean. And, and I, I love that phrase, filled with compassion. It didn't say he was filled with fear. Are we filled with fear about refugees? It didn't say he was filled with judgment. Are we filled with judgment about undocumented immigrants? It didn't say he was filled with anger. Are we angry uh, at the poor who might be on welfare or the homeless in our streets in our country? It said he was filled with compassion and he reached out and touched the man. And so I'm very concerned to the extent that this attitude of closing ourselves off to the world uh, infects the church. Uh, I don't like it infecting our country and I especially don't like it infecting our church because I believe what I said, we're all better off when we're all better off. And uh, we have, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan called America the shining city on a hill, which was a scriptural reference. We have the opportunity to be that shining city on a hill, but to be that shining city on a hill for the world, the principles of freedom and democracy and, and freedom of the press and freedom of worship, those values, we have to let our light shine. We, we cannot hide our light under a basket or behind a wall. Anything to add, Peter? Man, that's, I was enjoying listening there. I, um, uh, no need. Yeah, you know, may, may, the, the only thought I have is, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes there are real choices, and 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 uh, sometimes there are false choices, and I think you uh, presented a false choice. Uh, do we have to love our communities? Do we have to care about the opioid crisis? Yes. Do we have to care about other things? Yes, you don't have to choose. And I really think that's why Jesus told the story and really exposed the expert in the law who's trying to ask a similar question. Do we have to love people that are in my tribe or do I have to care about people that are outside? And, and, and part of that story too is, and, and, and love your neighbor as yourself, real simple. I, I like to picture when I see images of individuals I like to imagine these are my family members. 
I, 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 I find that it allows greater compassion. How would I respond if my kids were in this situation? There would not be apathy. There would not be a timid response. I would do anything possible to care. And, and so I think we have the opportunity to reject a false dichotomy, reflect, reject a false choice, and imagine, how would you want someone to respond if that's your family in that situation? A couple years ago, there was a book published called Toxic Charity by Bob Lupton, which caused a stir in some circles and certainly a fair number of churches, in which he argued that many of the ways that churches um, and faith-based organizations show compassion may actually do more harm than good. And he pointed at short-term missions trips and the like, which in some ways, because of their short-term nature, uh, could inculcate a sense of dependence that couldn't be sustained. Given your perspectives, what are the best things, most effective means of charity and compassion that individuals and small groups can do to alleviate suffering and promote flourishing? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it's really interesting because there was a period of time uh, where so many individuals had gone on short trips, short term trips, and there was this incredible amount of aid that was going around the world. And I believe that we are kind of people of a pendulum. And so the pendulum swung to the other side of saying, when helping hurts, right? Steve Corbett and Brian Ficker. Uh, and then toxic charity, Bob Lupton. And, and, and in some ways, I think that was a wonderful, wonderful time. It's what the church needed to hear, that not all good intentions have good results. My concern of that is that it also can lead us to believe that everything is broken. And it can actually lead to a position of almost paralysis, of saying, well, if everything that I try to do has these unintended consequences, I'm going to check out. I'm going to stop trying to care. And I think we need a sequel. I think we need a sequel to When Helping Hurts, which is When Helping Helps. And let's <laughs> shine all of the spotlight on the good things. And instead of toxic charity, awesome charity. Like, let's figure out the converse of these stories and let's celebrate the good work. And just personally, I, I, there's so many good things and, 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 and World Vision is doing so many, 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 many good things. The, the world that I look and what I have committed kind of my career to is, is this idea that there's, there, there's too little response focused on economic development and job creation. And, and so there's this stat from uh, Duke University that talks about how churches in the US respond to poverty. And the most common ways are food and shelter and housing. And those are good things. The least common way that the church in the United States responds to the issue of poverty is job creation. And I kind of think we got that order maybe a little bit out. Maybe we should elevate that a little bit more because if there is a good job, if there is employment, if we do look at the world as people with capacity and dignity, then maybe some of those other issues are not going to quite be so severe. Yeah. If I might just you know, add to what Peter said is, uh, uh, you know, I said in my remarks that um, sometimes, and I'm stereotyping you know, some church programs, we kind of feel like we can solve the most complex issues facing the human race by taking two weeks of vacation in Tijuana, you know, and uh, painting a house, digging a ditch. And uh, in fact, I, in my book, I asked the question, how would you feel about Bill Gates if he had decided uh, almost 20 years ago when he started the Gates Foundation that, hey, uh, I know what I'm going to do. Uh, there's poverty in the world, and I care about poverty. I'm going to go to Tijuana, Mexico once a year for a week, and my time is very valuable, a week of my time is very valuable, and I'm gonna paint houses and dig ditches and build latrines, and I will have done my bit to help the poor. Well, we would say, like, give me a break, Bill Gates. I mean, you're the wealthiest man in the world. Did you ever think about your money? Uh, did you ever think about your brain power? And did you ever think about the incredible giftedness and gifted position you are in, in, in the world, the relationships you have, the connections you have, what if you took that strategic mind and half of your money and said, I'm going to start a foundation that's actually going to work on really sophisticated solutions to issues of global health and global development? Well, that's more like it, Bill Gates. You know, uh, and, uh, and yet, we still have this sense, and, and I, I, I really appreciate the, the enthusiasm of wanting to volunteer, wanting to go, wanting to do something. And there is a role for volunteers. But as I shared, you know, solving poverty is rocket science, and 
If we were told there were a thousand people in Washington, D.C. tonight that desperately needed brain surgery, I hope we wouldn't all run out and say, I'll do it, I'll volunteer, I'll, I'll cut their skulls open and try to fix them because we obviously don't have the skills to do that for someone that needs uh, a very delicate surgery. So uh, I, I think there's a role for volunteers and there's a role for professionals. And if your church is large enough, I would encourage you to hire a development expert or two uh, in your missions department so that you can really understand at the root level what are the causes of, of the poverty in the communities we want to serve. And, and, and the other thing I would say, and, and I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with this, Peter, that uh, there's no quick fix to systemic poverty. This, this is a long-term walk and journey with a community. And World Vision typically works, uh, on average, 15 years in a community. Uh, and we like to say we're one of the few charities that likes to say goodbye because at the end of that 15 years, or it could be 18 or 13, uh, we want to hand the keys to the community and say, you can drive now because we've taught you everything we know. You know how to do this yourself now because you're the leaders of your community. Your community is filled with God-given potential and creativity and innovation and ideas and hard work. So God go with you, Godspeed, because your community is, uh, is really on the path now to, to prosperity. So less than a week ago, the president made a comment that I'm sure you've heard about referring to... I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> referring to some of the countries you've worked in in fairly scatological terms as fecal repositories. Uh, according to some reports, such as The Hill, he later told some friends about it and said that he thought it would play well with the base, uh, by most reports, the bulk of which are self-reported evangelicals. What, if anything, would you want to communicate with evan evangelical members of the base for whom that comment did play well? The first thing I would say, <laughs> I gotta be careful now, there's a camera running. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ was born in a hellhole. I mean, he was born uh, a refugee in a stable to a poor family from Nazareth, which was apparently worse than certain cities, you know, in New Jersey. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know um, we cannot blame people for where they're born or judge them by the economic uh, status of their country or their village or their community. Um, because we know as followers of Christ that uh, Jesus died for all those people in all those countries just as much as he died for Americans. And, um, you know, I once said to my 17-year-old son, I said, if you'd been born in Ghana, uh, you know, 20 years ago, in instead of going to Cornell University getting your degree, you'd be herding goats in, in, in Ghana because you would not have had the opportunity to realize your God-given potential to the same degree if you'd been born in a different place where there were fewer opportunities. Now, I'm grateful uh, 20 years later, Ghana is uh, kind of an economic tiger in Africa. It's growing, it's be becoming more prosperous. And there's a number of African nations that are, you know, are really developing in remarkable ways. Uh, and not just in Africa, we see it all over the world. And, um, and that's the process of development. Uh, the United States was fortunate to have a country with unlimited natural resources and only two international borders, and, uh, and we got the best and the brightest from every country in the world to come and build this country. And, uh, and how do we dare look at other countries and say, what's your problem? You know, we had every advantage uh, offered to us as a nation, uh, and now we need to turn and help our brother and sister nations uh, to become all that they can be um, when they have the opportunity. Sorry, I got a little into that one. But. <laughs> Peter, anything you want to add? Yeah, maybe just to say, you, you need some 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 more friends. If 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 uh, you talk about the world differently when you look through the lens of friendship, you do, you do. And and I know my world has been reshaped because of friends. And when I look at the world, when I look at uh, those comments, I look through the lens of friendship, and I am deeply offended. I wish, I, I, I hope I would have been just as deeply offended, but I'm, I know I'm offended at a very core level because these are not just comments. These are comments about friends, and, and that changes 
the way that we look at this. And, and again, it's so easy, perhaps, to just think you know of something. Again, the refugee uh, situation, whatever you think about that, hold your perspective, hold your tongue, until you have befriended a refugee family. Just don't talk until you have a friend. Um, if you want to make comments about another nation, don't make comments until you have a friend, a true friend. Uh, our family, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I live, uh, receives more refugees per capita, I was just told, than any other city. That's pretty awesome. Way to go, Lancaster. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so my wife and I jumped in, uh, and Marwa in Imad. And initially, we thought this would be a great opportunity for us to learn a little and to help uh, they opened up their home to us. They have given us the most amazing meals. We've been using Google Translate, trying to like have conversations. Our lives are better. Our kids' lives are better. And so if you find yourself wanting to write off a continent or a country, just stop talking and have dinner and establish friendships, because it will change the way that you talk. So we could go. We could definitely go on with this, but we want to turn this over to usually the most dynamic part of the evening, which is questions from the audience. So those of you who have been to a Trinity Forum event before know that we have three rules when it comes to audience Q&A. We simply ask that all questions be brief, all questions be civil, and all questions be in the form of a question. Uh, yes. So uh, wait until you're called on and you actually, uh, a microphone is in your hand before asking and questions from the audience right here. Uh, microphone's on the way. So my question is, um, there's development and then there's faith and Christians in development. Um, it was referenced to the gradual departure from this Christ-centered Christian start of many, if not most, Christian-based started motivated NGOs or PBOs. Can you please speak to how your respective organizations have maintained that faith focus in an environment that is growing continually adversarial to Christians in general? And being a former uh, employee of World Vision, Rich, particularly I know I, my impression is you have fought in, to maintain that Christ-centered focus, particularly for such a large NGO as World Vision is. So I just think that would be uh, helpful to know and understand the stories you have to not um, letting go of the faith aspect, which often happens in so that more money can be raised or you know, the organization can be grown. Well, Peter wrote a book on this, so I'll let him answer it in, in, in a second. But, um, but it's a real challenge. And uh, if, if anybody's ever had their extended family over for Thanksgiving, uh, you know how hard it is to keep even maybe a dozen people uh, civil with one another on the same page, agreeing philosophically about even what is on the table to eat. Uh, I know in our own family, we've got a vegan, a vegetarian, uh, you know, so if we serve turkey, we've got to have, you know, tofurkey as well, and we've got to have everything. But uh, World Vision with roughly 45,000 people from 100 countries in every nation, tribe, and tongue, if you will, uh, it, it's always a challenge to maintain a focused Christian identity and a focused sense of God within the organization in, in our mission, vision, and values. Um, and it's always a struggle. Someone once described World Vision as a bubbling cauldron of theological thought, you know, uh, an argument. And uh, that's one of the things that's wonderful about World Vision. We're constantly debating these things. But, um, but I would say that uh, there's, there's just a few things that are really critically important. We have something called our core documents, which are kind of like our Constitution of the United States, which 200 and some years later, we're still looking to the Constitution to adjudicate issues in our country. Uh, for World Vision, it's our mission, vision, and values, and something called the Covenant of Partnership and our Statement of Faith. And these documents are like scripture for us. Uh, our mission statement talks about, uh, you know, our mission is to follow Jesus Christ uh, in promoting human transformation, seeking justice, and bearing witness to the good news of the kingdom of God. It goes on to say, we will witness to Jesus Christ through life, word, deed, and sign that encourages people to respond to the gospel. And it says, we will partner with churches to promote spiritual and social transformation. All of those things are in our missional documents, and they're not up for negotiation. They, they are binding on all, um, all World Vision employees and all World Vision project areas, just like the U.S. Constitution is binding on all U.S. citizens. 
Uh, so we have those things. But it, at the end of the day, uh, if you hire leaders who don't fully embrace uh, the role of their faith and their identity uh, in their work, um, you will lose this in a couple of generations. You will lose that Christian ethos and Christian commitment. And those documents that are so important will become just gathering dust on binders on shelves. And so it's the leaders of the organization that bring those documents to life. Uh, there's a passage, I think, in Deuteronomy 11 where Moses is imparting advice to the people of Israel and he says, you know, talk about these things when you're standing up and when you're sitting down. Teach them to your children. You know, uh, tie them to the hems of your garments. Uh, post them on the walls, the doorposts of your homes. Uh, in other words, he was saying, if you don't constantly uh, marinate yourself in, in God's truth, uh, you will lose, uh, you will lose that, uh, that faith commitment. So I would say that if, if your organization is a Christian and it's not fighting and vigilant every day uh, to maintain those Christian values, you will lose it within a generation or two. Uh, and often the board of directors are the last people to know that they've lost it. So uh, anyways, those are a few thoughts. Yeah, no, and thanks for the question. And happy to have a conversation after uh, words as well. But uh, Chris Horst and I, uh, we did try to study this. And originally, it wasn't to write a book. It was just to apply uh, this. How do we make sure that Hope International stays on mission when we're no longer uh, here? And so we tried to follow Jim Collins uh, in Good to Great, the same methodology, where we tried to find organizations that stayed true, that were industry experts, that really had a great reputation in their industry. And then we tried to find the counterfactual. And then we tried to figure out, so what was the difference in story? And uh, we were hoping that we would find one issue that if you could just do this one thing, then you would prevent mission drift from happening. And we didn't find one. Uh, and, and, and we found it's the accumulation of small and sometimes what feels like inconsequential decisions that when compounded by time lead to a very different place. And so happy to go through them, but just maybe really, really quick, three. One is how, what do you measure for success? Most nonprofits look at size of budget, number of people that they serve as the primary definition of success. And if that is your definition of success, you will do anything possible to get more money and serve more people. And that's a good thing, but not at the expense of your mission. I was in Houston and had a foundation say, we love what you're doing with job creation. We don't love the Jesus so much. Um, <laughs> downplay that, and then we can come and support you. And it was a seven-figure check, not counting the decimal places. I normally count those. Um, and it was incredible where they, I definitely do. But for me, that was one of these like momentous uh, occasions where is growth the primary goal? Or is it mission fulfillment? So how you measure success is number one. How you hire. Uh, and, and for us, uh, we serve everyone regardless of need. We have a different stance of who we hire and even who we have as interns, because today's interns are going to be tomorrow's CEOs um, on that. HopeInternational.org internship deadline on Friday. Um, and, so, and then the third uh, piece on that uh, that we are looking for is then also uh, how, how, how you create the culture. What are the patterns? What are the habits? And if you have staff prayer and no one shows up, that tells you something about the culture. Do you believe that prayer is, is not just something you do, but it's the core? We can't do this without God. So how could we not prioritize that? So lots more I'd be happy to share. Yeah. Other questions? We'll try to, try to do some quick questions and quick answers. So we'll do Mark and then over there. Up in the front row and then over there. Thanks. Uh, I have a question for Richard Stearns. You, you talked about how religious communities understand each other, even if they're of, a, of different faiths, and that they kind of get you. And that helps in programmatic work. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the importance of the faith-based community and the secular community understanding one another. Because if we're to kind of get it right about the role of government, of the private sector, of nonprofits, to try and bring about flourishing, it is going to require the faith-based and the secular to work together. And it strikes me that some of the problems so close to us at home here uh, will require that as well. You know, there are uh, 
problems on both sides of that equation with the secular community and the faith community. First of all, the faith community doesn't, is suspicious of the secular community often. And, uh, you know, a couple of examples, um, World Vision's been criticized for taking U.S. government grants. You know, why would you take, uh, you know, money from the U.S. government? And uh, we've been criticized for going to U.N. meetings and engaging with the United Nations. We've been, I was criticized for serving on President Obama's Faith-Based uh, Initiatives Council. And my answer to that was the President of the United States asked you to serve your country, the answer is yes. And whether you agree with him or not on everything, if he asks your opinion and your advice, the answer is yes, I'll be happy to give it. Uh, but that suspicion on the faith side of the community of things secular is one barrier. But then on the other side, um, there is suspicion on the secular side of the equation about are these faith-based organizations, what are they really doing? Are they, you know, are they just doing mass conversions? Are they creating rice Christians? You know, we'll feed you if you become a Christian. And some of the, maybe the abuses of the past that were probably real. Um, are, are you professional enough in what you're doing? And so there are, there's suspicion on both sides of this equation. But I think, I like to say, I think it is very possible and is actually really necessary for people of good faith to work together with people of goodwill uh, to accomplish common goals. Because uh, there are atheists who are people of goodwill, who want what is best for their community. They want what is best for the poor. Uh, and, and some of them are incredibly dedicated to trying to do something that makes a difference and to help. Uh, and I like to think that people of good faith can work with people of goodwill and vice versa if we can kind of celebrate where we agree and work together on those things and not let the places where we disagree uh, hinder our, our, our ability to partner. Uh, and we can each maintain our own identity within those relationships. Um, so. Back there, saw a hand, yes. I guess I'm wondering about people, th there's a caricature of people who, um, maybe the conversation about Trump and the, the conversation about countries in Haiti and Africa, but I wonder if the media is driving the conversation about those people in America who feel disenfranchised and they're being caricatured as people who are ignorant and don't care about anybody else in the world, but they really feel as though they have been disenfranchised. And how do people in America who are in those positions, who don't feel that they're being represented by the media ad accurately, they're not thinking that all refugees and all immigrants are horrible people, they truly care about other people, but the media has driven the conversation and made them feel as though they are the villains. And are they? And how do we incorporate those people in America who are truly disenfranchised? Who wants to take a shot at that? <laughs> well, I, I I'll take a shot at it. You know, one of the things that uh, I get to travel around the country quite a bit, and I speak in churches in the heartland and on the coast and in Texas and different places. And, uh, you know, the people in those churches are across a wide political spectrum, but, you know, I've preached in very, very conservative churches. In fact, I, I preached at one in Lancaster County uh, in May. I snuck into your backyard and tried to church. peel off a few <laughs> child sponsors. And uh, It's my own <laughs> church. Yeah. But, um, and I... But the pastor said to me before I came, you know, he said, this is really a red county, you know, and it's uh, pretty conservative. And he'd asked me to speak about refugees. I go, well, thanks for inviting me into the lion's den, you know, <laughs> speak about refugees um, in this political climate. But he, he said, just, you know, try not to get too political in your comments. Keep it biblical. And, uh, uh, but what I find when I speak in a church in a red county is some of the most generous, loving, caring, giving people you could imagine. I, I, I find people sponsoring children who uh, really don't have enough money or income to do so, but out of the goodness of their heart, they want to help. They want to make a difference. They want to help these refugees, and they are being mischaracterized. And so uh, we do have to be able to see through the political veneers to look at the, the, what's in people's hearts. And, and there are Democrats and Republicans that have 
bad hearts, and there are Democrats and Republicans that have really good hearts and care about people, whether they're American or not. And so I, I think you're right. I think there is a mischaracterization, and often the media will take the most extreme example on either side and put them in front of the camera, and, uh, and they do that in a way to discredit everyone on that side of the political spectrum uh, by embarrassing them with you know, the way they characterize. So I, I think it's a problem, and it, and it also divides us so that it makes it hard for people of good faith and goodwill to work together uh, to solve problems, because there's too much animus between uh, the two groups, and that's kind of happening in Congress and in our country right now, which is challenging. I wasn't going to say anything, but Lancaster was brought up, so <laughs> I, I got to add just one thing on, on, on that. And you know, I, I think that um, I take great comfort um, in, in the fact that uh, the church, when we're doing what we're supposed to, we, we will be, we should be uh, known for incredible compassion in action. It's, it's, it's not just what we do, it's who we are, um, received and give. And, and so I hope that right now that there are many opportunities when all of these other things, that there is a different story that's being told, and it's being told at a local level, that when there is a need, Followers of Jesus are not running away, but they're running towards need. This is what we read about in The Rise of Christianity, the incredible book by Rodney Stark. And he said, when there were famines, when there were plagues, you know who was the most generous? You know who gave most sacrificially? It was followers of Jesus. And I want that to be true today. And on September 10th, Paul Singer wrote a headline story in USA Today, and it said this. It said, faith groups provide the bulk of the recovery effort. And I said, that's my church uh, on that. So I think we have an opportunity. Let's keep showing up. Let's change the narrative. Let's shine the spotlight on the good and the service. And, and let's change the way that media tells the story by the way that we live. I just want to add a punctuation. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to punctuate what you said because uh, if, we, if we look at the Church of Jesus Christ, uh, I like to say Jesus came to launch a revolution, not to build an institution. And, um, and, and that revolution that we call the Great Commission, the Great Commandment, was to go into the world's brokenness. Jesus came into the world's brokenness to reconcile, to heal, to rebuild, to repair uh, the human condition. And he sent his church into the world uh, and into the broken parts of the world as healers. Uh, we're to go out to repair human institutions, to rebuild families, uh, to reconcile relationships, to, uh, to, to invite people to enjoy life in all of its fullness, the abundant life that is talked about in John 10.10. 10. Um, and the church, when it's at its best, we're like the world's firemen. We're rushing into the fire, not running away from it, uh, even though we might get burned. And that's the church that people look at and admire. Uh, one of my former staff members said, World Vision has the Jesus that everybody loves, the Jesus that rushes into the fire to rescue hurting people. Uh, you know, Hope International has the Jesus that everybody loves. And if we as Christians would focus more on rushing into the world's fires, wherever they are, uh, they could be our inner cities, they could be in Rwanda, they could be in the Congo or in Southeast Asia, if we rush into those fires uh, with just one agenda, to love people, and to, uh, to do it in the name of Jesus, uh, the world would think about the Christian faith very differently than uh, they do maybe right now. Uh, I think the Christian brand has been damaged over the last uh, generation. And when we do these kinds of things, uh, it attracts people. That, that's what attracted people to first century Christianity, was the selflessness and the sacrifice of those early Christians who put others ahead of themselves. Well, there are far more questions remaining than there is time, and that seems like a great note to end on. So, Rich, Peter, thank you very much. <laughs> and Colleen, close us out. Wow, don't you always wish question and answer could go on forever? Well, I really do. So, so much wisdom, so much encouragement. Thank you all. Thank you for Cherie. Uh, my name is Colleen Horrocks, and I'm the Director of Advancement and Development for the Trinity Forum. Uh, it was a great discussion between Richard and Peter, and of course, here at the Trinity Forum, we don't take sides at all. It's not a debate where there's winners and losers, but um, one thing you might not know is that I graduated from Messiah College with Peter Greer. Yeah. So I just want to say, go Falcons. <laughs> you know.
Good work, Peter. Um, of course, Peter did go on to earn his MPP at Harvard. And uh, Richard, I understand you went to Cornell and then, of course, to Wharton, which are also very, very good schools. <laughs> so, so we're all winners here, but I'm just saying, go Falcons. Thanks very much. All right, so as the development director of the Trinity Forum, I'm actually here to report that we just closed out an amazing record-setting 2017, made possible not just by our incredibly generous trustees, but and not even just by those who have sponsored events such as these over the past year, but by those of you who are in the audience tonight and those around the country who are Trinity Forum Society members. So we just want to say thank you. So much of what we do from day to day is driven by your faithful commitment to financially support this work, which includes not only creating events like we shared tonight, but also includes publishing quarterly classic works which draw attention to the best of Christian thought from both yesterday and today, our Trinity Forum readings, and are specifically designed to help us think more deeply about the Orthodox Christian faith. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, currently Trinity Forum Society members <clears throat> yet, you should know that all supporting members receive not only a discounted registration to tonight and to all of our events, but you will also receive a new Trinity Forum reading each quarter. We do one of these per quarter, uh, as well as a daily email with expertly curated articles from current publications where we address the big questions of life, just like we try to do here. Um, publications include the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, and uh, hopefully we send over some uplifting type articles. If you're interested, and I think that you are, I can see it in some of your faces, um, you will not be surprised to learn that you, you, all of you, have the opportunity tonight to join the Trinity Forum Society this very night, really. So if some of you volunteers who are in the room for the Trinity Forum could raise your hands. All right, if you could come speak with Alyssa Abraham, Ashley White um, Brothers, or any of those who are here, including me, please feel in free and come talk to us. You do have a brochure there on your seats, which gives you all the information that you need in order to join the Trinity Forum Society. And as Peter says, you're joining a society of friends. We're really glad to have you here tonight, but we'd love to have you even more consistently. Um, also, if you loved this event and you would like to sponsor one such as this, please do talk to me. Our office number is 202-944-988. Yeah, one. <laughs> All right, also, we've been so grateful to hear from both Peter and Richard tonight, and we do have an opportunity for you to purchase their books for $10 each. There are several titles out there, but we only brought their best ones. Okay. They're, they're prolific writers, so we could only bring their best, really. Um, also, if you do join as a Trinity Forum Society member here tonight, are you sensing a theme? You will receive one each of each of their books of your choice, or you could just buy them all, because they're all very good. All right, so now, finally, I will end with thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> On behalf of Cherie and the entire Trinity Forum team, thank you both, Richard and Peter, for sharing your wisdom and your enthusiasm and your passion with us tonight. It's, it's uh, contagious. Uh, all of this has been made possible by the new Venture Fund with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We've been so grateful for that support and really for this entire series on faith and international development. We're sorry to see it go. We'd love to do more. And uh, thank you also to our priceless Trinity Forum trustees, especially those of you representing tonight, our chairman, Price Harding, and Richard Miles. Thanks so much to David for coming down from Atlanta. Really appreciate that. And um, also to our faithful volunteers, to Hannah Wolf, Nicole Noyes, Abigail Carlson, Lexi Marone, and intern Caleb Luke, as well as our incredibly talented phot photographer, Clay Blackburn. If you've seen Clay, he will also. Thanks very much. Please make sure that you uh, check out our Facebook page tomorrow. We'll be posting his amazing photographs, and you can tag yourself anytime you want. All right. Uh, and also, thank you, Cherie, for curating and moderating, as always, such a lively and thought-provoking discussion. And thank you to our Trinity Forum Society colleagues, uh, membership and events director Alyssa Abraham, who literally makes all of this happen, and for Ashley White Brothers, who keeps us running from day to day. Thank you so much. And thank you, all of you, for joining us here tonight and as Trinity Forum Society members. But thank you for going forth for contributing to the transformation of society by going now and tomorrow as friends and to Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth, to your homes and workplaces and putting into action those concepts we've learned and discussed here tonight. We are grateful, we are with you, and most importantly, go Falcons. <laughs> Good night.